The interview room is small and square. A table, three plastic chairs, a high frosted window, the glass grimy with dust, strip lighting. Our faces cast in dingy yellow shadow. Two cups of tea, one for the female police officer, one for me, white with two sugars, too much milk, but I'm not in a position to complain. The rim of my cup is patterned with indentations where, a few minutes previously, I bit into the polystyrene. The walls are off-white. They remind me of the squash courts at the RAC on Pall Mall, where, just a few days ago, I demolished an opponent who was several positions ahead of me in the club rankings. He was a banker, florid face, baggy shorts, surprisingly lean thigh muscles. I dispatched him fairly swiftly, serve, slice, smash. The rubber thwack of the ball as it pinged into concrete, a dark green full stop at the end of each rally. Grunting, swearing, eventual defeat, aggression, contained within four walls. The police station has a similar feel, a sort of bristling masculinity, even though only one of the two officers interviewing me is male. The woman has clearly been designated good cop. It was she who offered me the tea, said it would be beneficial. She also suggested two sugars. You know, she added, meeting my gaze, after the shock. It's true, I hadn't expected the police to turn up on my doorstep this morning. It's only the second time in my thirty-nine years that I've found myself interviewed by the authorities. On both occasions it has been because of Ben which is odd, really, given that he's my best friend. You'd expect best friends to take better care of each other. The female police officer is short, with rounded shoulders and a pleasant, freckled face. Her hair has been dyed that intermediate colour, inexplicably beloved of middle-aged women, which is neither brown nor blonde, but somewhere in between, a kind of beige, brittle at the ends. Her colleague is tall, one of those men whose height is his defining feature. He stooped when he walked through the door, holding a sheaf of papers in hands the colour of supermarket ham. Grey suit with a white mark on the lapel, toothpaste perhaps, or the left-behind smear of a baby's breakfast. He is, I'd guess, in his early thirties. The two of them sit across the table from me, backs to the door, the chairs have moulded seats with letterbox apertures in the back. We used to stack these chairs for school assemblies and end-of-term concerts at Burtonbury. A lifetime ago. And yet no time at all. Sometimes it seems as close as the next minute. Pencil shavings and plimsoll rubber. The scuffed mark of a trainer against the classroom skirting board. Dormitories with sagging beds the creak of a spring as a boy shifted in his sleep, that constant feeling of unease. That was before I met Ben, of course, before he saved me from myself. We've been saving each other ever since. On the table to one side is a large tape recording machine, too big, really. I find myself wondering why it has to be so big, or why, indeed, the police still insist on using cassette tapes in this digitised era of sound clouds and podcasts and iTunes. I've declined a lawyer, partly because I don't want to fork out the necessary funds for a good one, and I know, given the circumstances, Ben won't pay, and I refuse to get stuck with some snivel-nosed legal aid type who can't distinguish his ass from his elbow. I don't think Lucy's parents will stump up either. After everything that's happened, I suspect my in-laws might also be disinclined to help. Right then, says the woman, hands clasped in front of her, short nails varnished with clear polish, a tiny ink stain on the fleshy part between thumb and index finger. Shall we get started? By all means.'